welcome to Forbidden Planet TV and we are here today to talk about one of my absolute favourite books of the year, The Final Strife, which is here in person. <laughs> and talking about who's here in person, we've also got the fantastic author of The Final Strife, um, Sarah L. Arifi. So if we could start with, what can you tell us about too many spoilers uh, about yeah. Final Strife? Do you know what? I actually forget every time like what my book's about. This question is like literally every everyone will ask this question, right? And now I'm like, I have no idea. No, I do know because <laughs> I do write it. Um, so essentially, the novel follows three women with three different blood colours. Um, one blue-blooded, red-blooded and clear-blooded, and they represent the three different caste systems within the Empire. They come together as the Akhtabath Trials commence, which is a trial to determine the next three rulers of the Empire. And essentially, the, set, the stage is set kind of rebellion to brew. And you know what? You just have to find out what happens. <laughs> Like it. Um, now I hear this wasn't your first foray into writing. Um, Why did I tell anyone this? <laughs> <laughs> it's, do, it's doing the circuits. Um, so, what have you learned from like your previous experiences, and is there any um, books you could potentially come back to? No, first of all, absolutely not. Everything that I wrote previously was just a hot mess, like such a hot mess, and. Someone's like, oh, is there anything that you can salvage in there? No, no, it was so bad. It was like, she said happily, he said sadly. <laughs> and that was just the entire book for 70,000 words. So um, I have written for many, many years. I think my first full length novel, I was 14 when I wrote. Um, and essentially the same book, I've just been like recrafting it, recrafting it and um, editing it, rearranging it, and just reproducing the same novel over and over again. And Essentially, it was a white middle class boy finding out he's a chosen one. Okay. In a contemporary setting, it was also YA. And it was only at the end of 2019 that I realised, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing with yourself? Why are you writing this? You literally have no... I had no grounding in this experience at all, but I, it was everything that I'd read. Mm. It was everything that I'd seen in terms of fantasy. And that's not to say those stories, other stories weren't out there. It was a from a commercial perspective, that was what was, you know, thrown at me. Mm -hmm. I had one shelf in the library in um, in the village that I grew up in, and I remember living basically on this shelf. I wasn't an elf, but I did live, <laughs> I did <laughs> live in this library, and just constantly going back there and seeing, and not realizing actually until I was in my thirties and looking back on that memory and going, huh, I don't think there was anyone of color on that shelf at all, mm -hmm. and I just kept reading the same stuff and so I was re reproducing that same stuff and so when I got to 2019 really really quite old to have this realization <laughs> that um, I needed to I needed to stop and I needed to, to actually look inward and it was always a dream to be published but I think with the final strife it was very much like who am I who do I want to be and that was what I wrote and that was discovering me in those kind of the plot line and the story and the heritage that I have in those pages that really grounded me in this this world and mm. it made such a difference and no I will never look back on the other stuff honestly like anyone who reads it I will have to kill okay. so <laughs> <laughs> so it's never gonna see the light of day okay fair, fair enough fair enough I remember it was a while ago I think Samantha Shannon was talking about one of her early forays and yeah into books, involves aliens which, so. yeah <laughs> Um, She's telling me I about love it. her books. Yeah. But I was just like, I, I know. know. An I alien know. love story as well. Although I kind of want to read it, I'm not but, gonna lie. Yeah, <laughs> we we do so well with um, authors like Ruby Dixon, who yeah. does obviously yeah. like alien love affairs. Alien love affairs. <laughs> <laughs> That's PC enough, isn't it? Right. Yes. <laughs> um, so in Final Strife, there's a really interesting mix of Ghanaian folklore and uh, Arabian myth. So how much of that kind of comes from your own personal experience and was there like additional research needed? And... Yeah, so there's kind of two pieces of research that I did, um, which has many factions. So um, there was kind of my own personal experience. So my mum is half Ghanaian, half Brit British. Um, my father, Sudanese, Turkish and Yemeni, but essentially Arab and West African. My mum raised in Ghana, um, my father raised in Sudan, and then both of them from, uh, Islamic background and Christian background and then had me and my brother and sister and then moved to the Middle East so and then moved to Sheffield because why not <laughs> um, so my experience in life has been really 
an amalgamation of cultures, of food, of religion, of pretty much, you know, languages, everything, everything that makes society, I've had like a, a hodgepodge mess of, which has been great, but it's very, it was, it was really interesting for me to kind of go, okay, let's take these pieces and put them in a novel and like all these fun things that no one really will get apart from me. Mm -hmm. um, in this novel and, and what's re really interesting the only people who really do get it is my brother and sister who both read the novel and they're like oh yeah like that time we had Malahia and plantain together wasn't that wild and yes it is wild but then i've got um my cousins my Ghanaian cousins who are like oh yes i recognize these bits of, of ghana and then my arabic cousins who are like oh, i recognize this and so that's been like the most amazing kind of identity building stuff that went into it on the flip side i also did a whole bunch of research from a kind of colonialism and empire perspective um, those themes were really important to me I was going through a lot kind of realizing I was black yes I know I'm slow um, but I really wanted to kind of explore that and think about all these racist experiences that I had in modernity and how that then transposes in a world that is parallel but not exactly the same but then still has commentary on colorism and oppression and ultimately racism. So um, every kind of violence that's in the novel I've plucked from history, that's fairly transparent. Um, there's a lot influenced by the lovely King Leopold II in the Belgian Congo. Um, obviously not lovely, that was a joke. Don't start, <laughs> don't come for me. Um, but uh, yeah, so there was like that kind of research piece as well, which definitely influenced it. And, it, and from like a folklore and myth, mythical perspective, um, that was, very much storytelling based, so things like um, the Nancy the Stump Spider that I'd been told since I was a kid, um, stories of the Tannin in Arabic folklore and things like that, um, A Thousand and One Nights absolutely had uh, an impact on me as well, so um, yeah, I pulled on those threads and blah, made a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's more poetic than blur. <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks. <laughs> It's, it's, it's beautifully, beautifully done. Poetry vomit. Yeah, poetry vomit. <laughs> um, so to kind of touch on some of the things you just mentioned, so the kind of quite, at times, I suppose, brutal kind of caste system that you have as a way of kind of keeping the characters down almost, either through kind of a lack of education or um, drug use, for example. Um, how difficult was this to kind of write? Oh yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty brutal. I think most of it came from almost. I was just so horrified about how little I knew. Mm. I I pride myself in going above and beyond to like understand what happened in the past, and um, I don't think think I have a, a a British curriculum level of knowledge. I have slightly above that, <laughs> but um, what horrified me was like that gap in actually the British curriculum that misses things like an entire genocide that occurs um, in the Belgian Congo and, and things like that. And, and I just, that really horrified me to the extent of which I was like, why can't I find this history? Why is it tiny little pamphlets in libraries? Why is it not huge tombs of like things that we can discover and, and talk about? And I, I don't know, I think that really angered me. And so I was angry. And I think that's the best thing when you're writing a novel about empire, because if you're not angry, you're just gonna cry. And yeah. I, I, I had to remain angry because I had to give myself a voice. And I think I talk a lot about like the novel, even though it's fiction, it is truth in the sense that I was trying to discover a sense of uh, trying to fill in the gaps of silence in the past. Of course, I haven't done that. This is a fantasy book, but it is still giving voice to the voiceless in a way that I could do through the medium of fantasy fiction. And that was really, really difficult because there were times that I was researching stuff that horrified me. And you know, some people still come up to me like, why do the ghost things have no hands? Why have they got their tongues chopped up? I was like, read your history. This is not new. I haven't come up with this. Mm -hmm. And I think people are quite horrified by some of the, the, the violence in the book. And I'm like, it's not new. It's literally not even that old. Um, so, you know, that, that was something that I really wanted to bring to the forefront without kind of throwing it down people's throats like educate yourself but actually I think we all do have to do that and the final cycle is kind of like a well you know have a look at other other histories um which was really fun to do at the same time because I, I wanted to have my voice in that conversation from the drug addiction perspective that was really hard because I wanted to have that representation but I wanted to do it well 
and I definitely do, didn't do it as well as I could have in the first two or three drafts. I probably went through about 11 drafts, but anyway, we'll say the first two. <laughs> um, it was only, because I was like, I've made up this drug, I want this, I want it to be representing this mental illness um, that doesn't ever really go away, but I also want to, um, you know, make it up. You know, I, I was like, I don't want to have walls, but actually that was way more risky because I was just like, oh yeah, it's an opiate, or is it? Or, you know, so I had to actually start to, my, my internet history is like a mess. Um, and I had to do a lot of research about particular drugs. I, I basically made my own chemical formula of what Jova seeds are. And then I started building out exactly what those withdrawal symptoms are um, for, in, a, in a life cycle. So that was, you know, hours and hours, days and days, weeks and weeks of research. And then I had to apply that to the novel. And that was when I started my lovely spreadsheet <laughs> called Silas Addiction. <laughs> and it's literally scene by scene of how she's feeling and what she's going through from a symptom level. But even though I don't say that in every single scene she's in, because that would be too much, I had to know what she was feeling. So she's a little bit irritable in some of the scenes you read. Know that I know why that is, because <laughs> it sits in the spreadsheet and I know exactly how she's feeling on that kind of symptom chart that I made. So um, it was difficult, but I'm so I'm so proud of the the journey that I had her go through and the outcome of it and the lovely comments I've had from people so far. I I think mental illness isn't always represented in the best way. And we put so many of our characters through so much crap in fantasy, <laughs> so much. We're like, oh, trauma, yeah. They're all orphans, yeah. And I think actually having the other side of like, how do you handle that um, was really important to me, so yeah. yeah. I think as well with, I think all the characters go through quite a lot of kind of growth and development, but Sila in particular, I think, as it starts off, she is very unlikable oh, yeah. in those first few chapters. Yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of people would, you either have to love your main character or, or hate them. If you're indecisive, I don't think the book is ever going to stick with you in any yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, her development was incredible to read because yeah, you actually was... really love her. At the yeah. You're just like, I know, I remember um, Andrea Stewart saying to me, but at the end, I would do anything. I was like, I'm glad. That's what I was trying to do. So um, we mentioned before, just before the interview, about kind of obsessions with foods and yeah. things. And obviously there's a, there's a few kind of scenes of um, eating in the book. But I've got to ask, if you had to take one of your characters for dinner... Ooh, oh, I love this one. Oh, uh, I would definitely take... Hassa for dinner because Hassa deserves it. She goes through so much and like she's probably my secret favourite character, although I love Silo and Noor. Hassa's just there's something about her that I would just love to sit down and chat to her. And obviously I'd be able to read the sign language because I came up with it. So <laughs> <laughs> And I think it would just be yeah, I think that would be really amazing. And I, I'd love to take her for something that doesn't exist in the world, like Oh, something like really spicy, like Indian food of like really like the spiciest. Because I feel like she'd be like, meh, meh. Yeah. She'd be like, mm, yeah, it's fine. I just think it would be really fun. <laughs> just trying to think of the spiciest food and then coat it in sriracha. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Or like chicken wings covered in sriracha. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do that wing roulette thing. At oh yeah. Yeah, the hot get, yeah. Yeah, you get two hot wings. <laughs> um, so the characters are, are so kind of important to the book. Did the characters come before the world for you or was it? No, it was actually very much the other way around. So um, I was I know the exact moment the book came to me because I was sitting on the tube and I remember thinking, this tube is more diverse than my bookshelf and that's so sad. Um, and I and it wasn't I, I just knew that I wasn't looking for the right books. I wasn't, and I obviously publishing, you know, is fundamentally racist, but I think that I hadn't been supporting people of color like I should have been. And um, looking around, I thought, well, also you're writing the wrong book. You're not a white middle class boy. And that's when literally like a bolt of lightning, I, it's so dramatic, but it's so true. Um, 
I saw this blue sand dune and this white tree and I was like this is the world this is the world that this story is going to happen in and sm like small details came to me I knew that wealth was determined by the the size of the tree out front in front of people's houses I knew that there was this tide wind that reminded me of the sand devils in Sudan I remember as a child the moment where we had to shut all the windows because the sand devil was coming and it would just like pour into the house it was just like a, a little hurricane essentially of sand and I thought okay that's going to be the tide wind and then I was like and then there's Sila, and Sila just walked in and she was like yeah I'm here I'm fully formed do what you want and it was just like and and then with Anora it was very much I was trying to find it because I knew I wanted two point of views and I thought Anora has got to be everything Sila is not and actually in writing I discovered that they are actually the same in so many ways their motivations are really similar and that was then tricky to stylistically differentiate between them when I was writing their point of views because it was drama but um and then Hassa Hassa had no point of view um and then she just kept kept coming and kept coming and I was like come on speak Hassa come on and then this whole plot, plot line with her kept developed and I was like yes this is actually where the story is this is where you know the the heart of because without Hassa the whole plot couldn't work and I think that's been really special to me to see her grow and also into book two see her grow even further and become like a full-on main character has been yeah really really amazing yeah <laughs> it's it it's just incredible and the whole kind of you touched on before about language so you obviously got the the sign language but also even the idea of the blood magic and the blood brewing yes um so how did you kind of come up with the ideas for the different languages and are they kind of based on yeah so the sign language was um really interesting because i studied asl and bsl um not that i can sign but as in i spent a long time trying to sign um and tried to study how that would work in the world of final strife and quickly realized actually it's so so determined on fingers and hands that it wouldn't necessarily work for ghost things who have no hands um and so I started researching and looking for other forms of um, sign language. One of them that jumped out at me was a, a village outside of a car in Ghana, um, there are th only 350 people, but they have a genetic condition where they've all been born deaf, and it's a deaf, and it's a um, just a tribal village, so it's very you know remote, isolated, and they have developed an entire language-based system which uses 60% feet. And that was amazing for me to kind of develop this language, leaning on these real world examples. So I was able to see exactly how that would work. I, I you know, there was an entire um, thesis, thankfully, I didn't have to do a thesis, but the <laughs> thesis existed on this, um, this village and uh, to see how they actually, you know, developed this language with their feet, with their toes, how they moved their shoulders as well. So. I think it was only about 20% hand and that was perfect for me because I could then, you know, lift around 3,000 signs <laughs> um, to develop a, a language that um, used other body parts. And with it, with the runes, it was always for me about blood, ma blood the blood magic was always, was always going to be about education and that was an important point I wanted to make because um, the embers are the only ones who can do magic. Um, and they are the ones who are taught how to write in these runes and I think that commentary on society and how magic is almost gifted to those who are more educated was really important to me so that language based blood magic known as blood work um, was really important so that's what that was kind of the commentary I was having there again kind of touching on language the character names are quite interesting so how did the character names and some of the kind of names of um, different things in the world kind of come to you. Were they a mix of? Yes, people? definitely a mix. So some of them were definitely like based on Arabic words or names. Um, I actually forgot. <laughs> I only remembered recently that Sila is based on, um, softly based on the word for demon in Arabic. Uh, which I'd forgotten I had done, so I only realised a few weeks ago. But um, so that was it was really interesting to me to re remember this piece of information because I was like, oh, you actually from the very beginning saw the dark side of her. So when I was mm. even developing sign, I was like, you are starting from a very dark position. 
demon, you know. Um, Anor was based on the uh, Arabic name Nor. Um, there were just some some words that definitely lent themselves to either Ghanaian names like Kwame or Arabic names like Anor. Um, and then there were some characters that just came fully formed, like Fail, who <laughs> is just a side char character, a total himbo. He's married to the Warden of Crime. He is all muscle, no brain, and he was just always fail. He was F A Y L, and I was like, "Yeah, that's you. I'm really sorry, Himbo, but that is you. You are called Fail." And I just love that that some characters that come to you just like that, and like Loot as well, um, who's the Warden of Crime, came to me as Loot, and I, I, the, there was just the play on kind of treasure and hidden treasure, and there was something that just fitted him so well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was. It's, it's definitely a mix and then when it comes to the actual world building so um so i have like jinn um as the the word for the kind of city so you have jinn laham which is essentially jinn is a word that i've made up um that felt right for the world and then laham is the city that is uh their main export is livestock and laham basically just means lamb so, <laughs> <laughs> so there are some that are very obvious um, and then some that uh, that I have just played and tweaked with, so, yeah. Um, so we mentioned as well about the kind of um, looking at characters from um, different worlds and, and dealing with kind of, yeah, very strong kind of uh, black characters. But also it's fantastic to see in this book the kind of, the normalization of kind of queer and trans and it just feels so authentic to the universe. The universe. Um, how important was that? Oh, so important. That was so active. I was, like I said, I was angry while I was writing this. And another thing that was happening in the world at the time, and has been happening for a very, very long time, is um, transphobes exist. <laughs> and they make me very, very angry. Um, and so I, I was actively having a very loud conversation at them with the building of the world at the final strike, because um, what I really wanted to, you know, the oppression and colonization and themes of empire and racism were really important to me as from a perspective of identity was me finding myself in these pages. When it came to the perspective of presenting gender on the page, I really wanted to show how easy it actually can be. Um, now, that doesn't mean it was easy for me. I worked really, really hard to make sure that the presentation of gender was how I wanted it to come across, which was, I wanted queer joy, so I wanted to keep queer normativity, and I also wanted a society where there wasn't a binary. The problem is, we do not have that in the world that we live in, and so ultimately, if I was being really true to the world, no one would actually have she, her, or he, him pronouns, because gender doesn't have the same constraints as it does in our world. Unfortunately, we have to translate that into our world, and that meant holding on to some of those hooks. Um, so I worked with, I think, six trans consultants during writing the book, and that was incredible for me. Um, it was the biggest pleasure of my career, probably, just having that opportunity to show transgender joy mm -hmm. um, having a character like Hassa who is trans but it's not a it's not a question it's not an issue it's not a thing that I labor on it's that's what she is mm -hmm. she has chosen to be woman and um, yeah it, it, it was I had a lot of I spent a, a, actually probably the biggest research piece of the whole novel was around gender and I spent a long time trying to grapple with how gender would present itself in the world and it was it was really amazing for me to learn as well and take my knowledge further um, but I, I am so so proud of what I ended up with because there is so much trans joy in it and and that doesn't mean everyone's going hey I'm trans I'm joyful it's just meaning that there is no trans pain there is no um, oppression there is no you know moments where you question why this is happening or why this person it, it, it's, it's just it's just simple mm -hmm. and though it's simple to read it's harder to write because you're you're battling with the world here 
Um, and from a queer normativity perspective, I knew, I knew that there was, was going to have a sapphic romance um, from the very beginning. Um, as a queer black person, it was for me so important to have a queer normative world. Well, that like also, if I didn't, there'd be so much pain in this book. It would just be all pain. <laughs> I was like, I need some fun. Um, so that was yeah. So that was really important to me as well. Um, having those two elements yeah. together. It, it is great to kind of have that joy because I think I think we've all read books where maybe some of the ones more in the traditional kind of grim dark where it's been every, everyone dies no one's happy yes. <laughs> yes. kind of thing um, and you just need some something yeah you need some, and there's so much heart in here so it, it's amazing um, so um another question um that I was devising came to me this morning on on the train on the way in but i was thinking about the trials yeah um and i was thinking god i wonder which trial do you think you would perform best in <laughs> none of them would die honestly <laughs> like, even like the tax one i was like that is like, I, was like, I just die i just like i don't even know numbers i don't one two three that's as far as i can go um i don't know i think even when I was thinking, because I've thought about this a lot, the, the trial of strength, um, the, the, the tactics one, where it's the team based one, I'm like, I would absolutely be like the, the one they sacrifice or the one they leave behind, or <laughs> I'll just like not be able to keep up with the group and then I'll die off or something. I'd definitely be one of the early, the early <laughs> people who dies. Even like Aerofield, the first tr uh, trial of strength, I would, I can't throw. Like, I, mm. I can't. Like, I, I'm, I'm trying to get stronger but I'm I'm not I, I'm not in any way I have abilities with anything that I can throw like I could not throw an axe could not throw anything so um no I just I'd die that's the answer <laughs> I'd die, I, I die. <laughs> I, I'd just panic as well I'd just like probably freeze and panic I can imagine that audience no no so before we were just saying about gaming and stuff and obviously you're into gaming is there any particular games that have influenced how the books turned out? Yeah, I think um, I play a lot of kind of RPG, so um, definitely things like D&D, &D, um, but also from a kind of gaming perspective, I also, you know, The Witcher, Assassin's Creed, all of them, Horizon 1 and 2, which I loved, um, so many of that kind of adventure. Mm -hmm. And epicness is in the final strife for sure. Um, that kind of, you know, it's it's almost like writing's like gaming. You know, you can literally just put the character where you want. Um, and so, hundred percent, that's been influenced just by yeah, the yeah. world that I created. Have you pre-ordered the book or as well? Don't need to, but I've you, got you, it. Oh, she's gone in. She's gone I've got, got, got it in. in. I've got it in. <laughs> My partner plays. Uh, works at PlayStation. I think there was someone who used to work here who went to PlayStation. We should have stayed in touch. Yeah. <laughs> such a good connection. Oh, <laughs> um, so, uh, to finish up, what are you currently reading and what is your favourite underrated book? Ooh. So, underrated, I actually think N.K. Jemison is underrated, even though she's a big name, I don't think she's necessarily commercially read mm -hmm. as many books in the UK and I think if people haven't read N.K. Jemison that should absolutely be top of list. Um, I've just finished Babel by Rebecca Kwong and I don't know if I'll ever read again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm traumatised. Um, yeah that was that was a feast for the brain. Um, also it's like paralysed my brain I'm like can I ever write again? Um, but yeah, that has been an incredible kind of ride, um, and I can't wait to get to talk to her um, when she comes over. Uh, so yeah, so that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, I've also just finished God Killer by Hannah Kainer, which is coming out in January next year. Um, it's wonderful, everyone should have it on their radar. It is so good. Kind of lone wolf um, trope, but a woman, and um, she's essentially a God Killer, and she goes around um, killing gods that spring up when people believe in them and it's it's just so epic and so amazing and I think that's definitely should be on people's radar. Oh my god that sounds amazing. Yeah it's good. Oh my god. I was just thinking of the, the new Thor film. Uh, yeah. The, the kind of, oh, god yeah, yeah. 
it's Sounds really incredible. good. Sounds really good, really good. But um, yeah, well, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining Absolutely. us today. Um, and yeah, we'll have, obviously all of these will be signed and available to purchase on forbiddenplanet.com and in all nine of our stores. Um, so thank you so much. And yeah, I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.